Welcome to Milkshake Monday, episode 151. What are people talking about? Now, if we just go quiet for like two seconds, you hear left and right. There's nobody talking except for me. But for the most part, many of us find that we're either talking or listening to talkers or pondering what somebody has just talked about. Just today, I was thinking about some of the media attention and what has been on the news and the radio and what has been going on with emails and Facebook. And I could say, okay, today my oldest sister turned 72. My middle sister a couple weeks ago turned 70. That's news. I had a hairdresser appointment. I heard the news about Carly B on BET Awards announcing her second baby. There's news about legal issues with the Trump Organization or Biden and his infrastructure or the tragedy of Surfside, California and the condo that collapsed and hopes and dreams that somebody that is a loved one may be found of the missing 151. There's a lot of things that we listen to that people around us are talking about, people that are famous, people that are your family, people that are regular people that are in the grocery store. A lot of people talk and there's a lot of listening and half listening, but there's a lot of things that are not being said. So tonight we're going to talk about some things. Interesting enough, Faith brought in the mail and in the mail, there was this uh, magazine, the Essence magazine, and she was flipping through it and she said, mom, look at this. It talks about the 10 things people are talking about. Now I had done the teaching and announced the teaching hours earlier in the morning and I had prepared for it before today. So what I had gathered is things that people were talking about. I had no idea what Essence Magazine would say, but I, I won't take my time tonight to go over that list, but you can see for yourself. But here's how I'm going to categorize the things that we find ourselves talking about. And you'll understand some things in a minute when it comes to the scriptures and what we're going to be teaching about, about what people are talking about. Now, the number one thing that you often find people talking about are themselves. We have a great habit of always wanting to tell people about what's going on with us and how things are going and that kind of stuff. So the number one category is self. That's one of the things that we put as number one, what we're talking about. If you talk to some people, they're going to tell you about every problem they have, everything going on with them and their family and all that kind of stuff. So self is number one. The second thing are normally politics lately. I mean, thank God we've had a change of administration because I was really getting really sick of hearing about the same person for the last five years. It just got old after a while. But people talk about politics or people in control or famous. And so that's a lot of times what the entertainment or the media or politics, that's what takes a lot of oxygen for what we hear and see in the media or on the newspaper or however you want to get your information. The third thing I would say would be tragedy loss, sadness, diseases. I mean, if you see what's happened over the last few days, we have been consumed by a very important topic, a very tragic topic of that condo collapsing in Florida. But if it had not been the tragedy of the condo crashing, if there had been some breakout of disease, I mean, we've for a year have been really tied to our homes over the tragedy of the global pandemic. So let's say tragedy is number three. The number four I would say would be you're complaining. You're, you're upset about things or you hear about other people who are upset about things. So you hear about the, the complaints and the regrets of people when it comes to things that are happening in their lives or things in the past that have happened to either you or people that you're listening to, what's going on in their lives. And then I'd say number five would be hopes and dreams and aspirations, things that people really want for their future or for their children's future or something that they want when it comes to uh, an aspiration, something that they have as a far off or short or long-term dream. Could be about their job, could it be about their kids, what they want for their future. Oh, I wanna be in a bigger house. I wanna have bigger things. I want all kinds of stuff, but hopes and aspirations and dreams. And last but not least, on a little list of six would be religion and faith. You, I could tell you if 
you go and listen to any news broadcast or go look at the newspaper or listen to your friends, your family, your neighbors, people in the grocery store talk, rarely will anybody be talking about their faith or religion and certainly don't talk a lot about the Lord Jesus Christ specifically. But those are going to be tonight, the top six that we're going to say what people are talking about. What does that matter? But think about this. If I'm saying to you what the top six things that people talk about, I want you to also think that, think that a lot of people don't talk about some of those very things about themselves. They don't talk about the things that they really believe and think when it comes to people in power or politics. They don't really tell you how they feel about uh, some of the things that are happening that we call tragedy that they may say is a hoax or they may not think it is a tragedy at all that people can't vote. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's going on that we call a tragedy, a shame, but people say, oh no. They may not say it out loud, but these are things they dare not say because you may pass judgment on these things that they don't feel the same way you do. And they're a secret for the most part because what people say may be one thing, but how they really believe may be a totally different thing. So we're gonna get into that. We've got a lot to talk about tonight. So we're gonna be, if you looked at the scriptures, we're gonna be in Luke, but we're gonna work backwards. We're gonna first start out with Luke chapter nine. And there's gonna be a purpose for that because we as Christians, I believe are, we know what we're supposed to do. And I think over time that we're losing sight of the mission of what Christ wanted us to do because there's so many things of that one through six list starting with self that have crept into the house of worship and we're focused more on the things that we want, the complaints that we want to fix, the politics of the day, the tragedies, the hopes and aspirations. And then we get down to the sixth thing. What is our faith and what does the word of God tell us we should be doing? So out of Luke chapter 9, you have that Christ has called all of his 12 disciples. At this time, Judas is a part of the band. He is the son of perdition, but he's still being called because he is one of the 12. So there are times that you may find even in your ministry that you're calling people together and you're going to give them what thus saith the Lord to you in your spirit as pastor or bishop or whatever your senior leadership is. But everybody that you're calling together aren't always in the same accord of what God wants to do. But in this case, Judas is still a part of this 12. So let's start at verse one of Luke chapter nine. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Here is the mission that has not changed since Jesus gave it to the 12. But I want to call something to your attention. Verse two says, he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. I want you to see that order because I think we are focused on healing the sick and doing the things and the work of the diseases, the social programs, but the preaching the kingdom of God is getting less and less attention by those of us in the believing world. Now, I'm going to wait for verses three through five for the end. Where are you going to see? He says, don't take the following. And he's going to tell some instructions for the people going out. But I want you to jump over to verse six. Verse six says, so they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. I want you to see there are two separate events. There's preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God. And in addition to that, there is healing not the cart before the horse. The whole purpose was Christ has given them power and authority so they can do certain miracles, yes, but his purpose is for them to go out and preach and teach. Now, as they're going all through the areas and the towns, I want y'all to think of something. It was never Christ's imp uh, impression or purpose for them to go and keep their mouth shut. They were always supposed to go out and preach to teach the kingdom of God. They were going to interact with people and that was their purpose. In addition to healing the sick. Things start to happen and Herod sees that activities are going on. So here's what's going to happen. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard 
of all that was being done by him. And he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead. And by some that Elijah had appeared and by others that one of the old prophets had risen again. Now, I'm not going to get, you have to read the scripture for yourself because I can only in the limited time tell you some things. So Christ has given the mandate to the disciples. Word is a buzz to the point that the Tetrarch Herod, the person in leadership of the government is hearing about things going on. He's getting feedback of who, what people think. Now I want y'all to go down further. Verse 10 says, they've been sent out by Christ. They've been empowered. They've gone to do the work. And now they're returning in verse 10. Verse 10 says, and the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethesda. What you're going to see is that people found out there was supposed to be a private place, but people came. But we're not going to talk about the piece of people about the people coming. But I want you to see something that happened during that phase. But we're not going to focus on the whole have them sit down and them feeding. I want you to see what Christ does itself. He says, verse 11 says, but when the multitude knew it, they followed him and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and heal those who had need of healing. Again, he puts what's important. He's teaching and preaching about the kingdom of God. Separate and distinct from the teaching, he is using his miraculous power and authority that he has, and he is healing those who are in need of healing, but not putting the carpet before the horse. He always preaches and teaches. Now he's seen his, his gentlemen, his disciples, the apostles, go out, he, com he comes down, and we're going to jump to verse 18. He's just fed them. you got to read the scripture. He finds that he goes away, and he's praying. And we know who he's praying to. He's praying to the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But there's prayer. When the disciples join him as he is praying to the Father, this conversation has a turn. And that's why I say to you tonight in the title, what are people talking about? Because Christ asked that question to his disciples and we have a question being asked to us as well. But I want you to see verse 18, same chapter of Luke. And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him and he asked them saying, what do the crowds say? Who, who do the crowds say that I am? Who do the crowds say that I am? Now, before we go there, can I ask y'all a question? Christ is asking them, who do the crowds say that I am? So there's an assumption that when you all went out, you were listening to what people were saying about who Jesus Christ was as you were preaching to them about the kingdom of God, as you're walking down from town to town, going from house to house. When I say house to house, you're following God's direction to say stay in one house. But as these disciples are going from town to town, they're staying in places. They're hearing conversations. They're mingling with people, interacting with people. I don't understand how some Christians today think that the only people that they're supposed to talk to is their family and church members, and they're not supposed to be going place to place talking to people about the kingdom of God. But God, God Jesus Christ, says to them, who do who the crowds say that I am? Now, verse 19 says, So they answered and said, John the Baptist... But some say Elijah, and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. Now, did we not just hear when Herod, the governor, the Tetrarch, had that very same concern about what's going on, he's hearing the same chatter about what, what people are thinking. But the same listing of, is it John risen from the dead? Is it Elijah? Is it some old prophet? The same chatter is getting to Herod and these disciples and apostles that are out there in the crowds are hearing that same confusion because they're not sure who is doing this. What's this Jesus Christ about? Is it really him or is this John who's risen from the dead? So the same chatter is coming about. 
Here's verse 20. He hears their answer from what the crowds are saying, but he turns it back to the disciples then and to us now. This is right after he's prayed to the Father. Can you imagine there's a discussion between God the Father and God the Son and the Holy Spirit. And immediately when these disciples come, after they've had the feeding of these people, after they've gone out to the towns, after they've seen all kinds of things happening in the preceding uh, chapters of Luke, this question comes to them. Who do the crowds say that I am? But then he turns it on them. Verse 20. He said to them, but, but who do you say that I am? Many of us go and we share the gospel. I hope many of us do. You cannot share what you don't know yourself. You can't tell about the intimate love and forgiveness and compassion and mercy and truth of the Lord Jesus Christ without you knowing it for yourself. Christ has just heard his disciples say that people have all kinds of understanding or misunderstandings of who they're saying you are, but he's going to turn it back on the disciples as he turns it back on us. Who do we say that he is? Who do you say that I am? Before they could come back, Peter answered. But sometimes when we are afraid to go out to the masses is because we're afraid that they're going to ask us about who do we understand Christ is? Who has he been in our life? What has he done to us personally? And are we ready to give a witness or we're afraid? We want that to be Pastor Helm and Reverend Watts's job. We don't want to have to tell them personally of who Christ is for us. But Christ is telling us to go. And just like he's given the power and authority to those disciples, we're his disciples. We have to be able to open our mouth and proclaim and preach the kingdom of God and the fullness of who Jesus Christ is to us. And he's saying to his disciples, but who do you say I am? I asked you, the crowd says, and they got some misunderstandings, but now you all are my representatives. I've been walking with you. I've been teaching you. You've been seeing the miracles of God. You've been seeing the prayers. You've been hearing the voices. Tell me, who do you say that I am? Peter answered in verse 20 and said, the Christ of God. Now you think it's strange in verse 21 when Christ strictly warns them not to say anything and he tells them about what's going to have to happen, but... I want y'all to see verse 23, because when I talk to you about the six things from self all the way down to religion that we find that people are talking about, they find themselves in this passage of scripture and in another passage we're going to read in a second. Verses 23 says of Luke 9, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Self, self is number one. Let him deny his self, talking about his self, only thinking about his self. Self, self, self. Let him deny his self and take up his cross daily and follow me. It's all about self. You have to turn what you hear people talking to you about when they want you to be distracted about the things of themselves. I'm sick. I'm this. I don't have this. I'm going to complain about this. You have to say, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me take your eyes off of yourself and let me talk about the one true Lord Jesus Christ. So verse 23 says, you got to deny yourself. Verse 24 says, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. It's interesting to me about politics. When I think about our country and I think about the things that need to be done to help support everybody in this country, every situation in this country, 
to me, it's not about red and blue sometimes. It's about people being so full of themselves and their position, and they would rather keep and save their job, save their money, save their staff, save their stature, save their power, save their seat at the table, save their, their vote because they want to get all the money. It's all about saving themselves in that position and not thinking about themselves. And it makes me think that, again, they don't want to deny themselves from verse 23. And verse 24 is just keeping on adding on more selfish things that you're going to think about yourself, your own life, before you think about your eternal life. You're going to be so focused on the short time of the lifespan that's here. But verse 25 says, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the son of man, will be ashamed when he comes into his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Now, I'm going to let y'all chew on how a lot of these pieces fall within the one through six. We got to go to another scripture. In Luke 8, I said we're working backwards. Christ is going to talk to the disciples about the parable. Now, I've taught about the parables, so I'm not teaching about the parables tonight of the seed. But I want you all to understand that in Luke chapter 8, you will see that Christ explains again how even in what we hear every day and what we experience, we still find that the seed of God's word, the word of God, is falling by the wayside, that you find that it's not just falling by the wayside outside of the church, in the church, that you have people that are so focused on themselves, here we go, that the word of God, when they hear it, is falling by the wayside. And then it finds that it's on the rocks. And then it seems that it's falling in between those thorns. And you say, well, what does that have to do with what people are talking about? Because you could share the word of God willy-nilly. And you find that you are spending more time willy-nilly just throwing out seeds. And I'm not saying you can't proclaim Christ, but you need the Holy Spirit to lead and to guide and direct you for who you need to share those seeds with. Because there's a lot of people, I say this all the time. There's a lot of mamas and grandmamas and neighbors and uncles and brothers and preachers and teachers that they will spend their time talking to people who have no interest in Christ. But God will lead them to somebody that's a stranger who he's drawing by the Holy Spirit. And instead of the, the seeds falling by the wayside, you have an opportunity to fall on good ground because God and the Holy Spirit has been tending that ground and they want to hear the word of God and they have that ear to hear. But we want to focus all of our talk time, all of our energy time on people that are going to let this fall by the wayside, that's going to work on the cares of this world. And here's something I want y'all to read. I'm going to read the scripture so you can hear it's not me. It's not me. So we're in chapter eight of Luke. We're going to start at verse 11 and we're going to do some scripture. So I'm going to read it straight and then I'm going to explain something. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy and these have no root, who believe for a while, and in time of temptation fall away. Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they've heard, go out and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. No one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sees it on a lampstand that those who enter may see the light. 
Now this verse 17, I want to say, because today it was interesting that as I was preparing this, something transpired and made me understand something the Holy Spirit had brought to my attention tonight. People talk about what they want to talk about, that they're willing to have you hear. But there's a lot of things about themselves, those secret sins that nobody knows about. That they're not going to talk to you about that. They can't trust you with that because you'll think differently about them. Then they'll know something that you don't want them to know. So there's a lot of things that people may run their mouth. Just talk, 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 talk. But everything that somebody may run their mouth about, you better know that there are things that they're not willing to share with you. That's in the house of God or outside the house of God. But here's a scripture I want y'all to hear because a lot of people think that God is stupid. They think the Christians are definitely stupid, but they think God is dumb too. And that's not the case. Verse 17 says in Luke chapter eight, for nothing is secret that will not be revealed nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Therefore, take heed how you hear. A lot of people talking, guys. A lot of you are talking about nonsense. Even you say you're Christians, you love God. You're talking about nonsense. Every day that I have to read Reverend Helms' Facebook, I read it because I'm making sure I, I let him know what's going on. I read things that he needs to, to see. But every day I hear the same thing, I guess because Somebody has had a birthday. Somebody has an anniversary. Somebody has had a loss. I'm not making little of any of this. It's like every day somebody, somebody's got a beautiful picture of themselves or their grandchildren. Somebody's got a pretty, pretty picture of a party they went to. They want to dance. There's going to be some funny thing. There's always a kid thing. There's always a dog thing. There's always advertisement. There's always some sad song. There's some people putting scriptures up. There's some people putting encouragement. There's people putting stupidity up. Every day, it's just a different day, but it, you know, it's the same kind of stuff. People get together. People don't get together. People do some shade on there. People take away shade. It, it, it's the same thing, but we find ourselves on these contraptions every day, but God is trying to tell us we got some important things to get done, but look at this verse here, 18. Therefore, take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have will be taken from him. Now, this transition goes on, and I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move along. It transitions from him talking about seeds and talking about the word of God. And all of a sudden they say, hey, Jesus, your mama, your mama, your family outside, they looking for you. And Christ says to him, to the people that are saying this, he doesn't say like us, oh, let mama in. He makes a distinction to let them understand something about, I think they're so into the natural that they think he's going to stop everything for mama, like some of us do. Mama got this, I'm going to stop everything. Daddy got this, I'm going to stop everything. But he understands the grander plan of God. And he says here in verse 20, and it was told him by some who said, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. Verse 21 of Luke 8. But he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are, are these who hear the word of God and do it. I, I really have to, when the Lord puts it on my heart about this Virgin Mary thing, I really would like to discuss it because people don't understand that vir, the Virgin Mary, Mary was a virgin at Jesus's birth, but after she had Jesus, she and Joseph had sex and they had children, boys and girls who they're, these brothers are part of that child, the childbearing that Mary had. She didn't stay a virgin. She's not somebody that we are supposed to be elevating above Christ and we put her in the prayer chain. There is nothing in the scriptures that says that when you need to go pray to the father that you need to be praying through Mary. Where'd y'all get that? She's a sinner saved by grace through the blood of Jesus like all of us are. We're going to move on to Luke chapter 7. Why is it that we find that we are not doing it? Remember he says in verse 21, these who hear the word of God and do it. 
Why are we having a problem with that? Luke 7 helps us. I really believe it helps us because when you find that Christ, we're going to be there in verse 42. I'll do 41. Verse chapter 7 of Luke, verse 41, where he talks about the creditor and gives the example to the guy that he's there at the dinner to say, given his parable. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Now, as he's going there, he's asking this question because there's a lady there who's crying at his feet. And the thing I would think that we have a problem with doing the word of God, hearing it and doing it is because one, we don't want to do it. We're afraid to do it. They're going to ask us questions. They're not ready to answer. We're not thinking of studying and preparing. And, and then we have this problem here. We kind of think that we're at the 50 of, of the debt, of the sin life. We think we're at the 50 and everybody else is at the 500. But that's not how it works. But look at, even if you were thinking that you were at the 50 versus the 500, there's something Christ says here. In 42 of this verse, verse 42, the guy says, verse 42 says, and when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he kind of says something to them in a loving rebuke. But it's also something for us to understand because those of us in the, in the house of God that are doing the work of God, the urgency that we have to understand is that those who don't know Christ, that the Holy Spirit is drawing us to start talking to or witnessing, they're ready. But we're the ones holding back and not hearing and doing the work of God. But here's what Christ is saying, because we kind of take him for granted. And that's what they kind of done here. And that's what he's kind of showing here. Verse 44 says, then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. But this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet in fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with them began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Those of us in the house of worship, it's not that we don't see the sinners. We don't understand who doesn't know the Lord. But if they're not in our family, if they're not in our 411 information line, we're not going out to try to find them. We're not going out of our way. We're not going to do anything that causes us to sweat. We're not going to do anything that just takes us over that little love because something about what we understand who Christ is for us and them is not coming across clearly. Last scripture I want to take us to. I want to take us to Psalm 139. I love Psalm 139. I love a lot of scriptures, but I say this scripture even for people who are just learning of the word because what I, even today when I was talking with someone, a friend, we say scriptures to people and the word will not return void. Hear me. The word will not return void. How you talk to people, you have to explain to them who is Jesus Christ to you. What is your testimony of the love and forgiveness and compassion and the preached word of the kingdom that brought you in, that God, the Holy Spirit, will help you to be able to say, say it compassionately with the seasoned word of the Holy Spirit on your lips and your heart? 
to minister to these people who we all were, we all are sinners saved by the grace of Christ. But we just kind of throw scriptures at people and say, okay, I said it, I'm gone. I'm going to the grocery store now. I done said it. I'm going to the bank now. I done said it. I'm going off to do my business. I done said it. I'm done. That's not showing love. That's showing a little love. But I want y'all to understand that what people are talking about is not going to get them to know Christ. You have to take charge of the conversation sometime. When the Holy Spirit draws you to some people talking, Maybe it's one, maybe it's two, maybe it's a group. You'll, you'll know because the Spirit will give you the knowledge of what he wants you to say of his word that's going to point to Christ. And I want y'all to understand that Christ knows everything about where we are, what we're doing, how we're doing it, how we think, how we don't think, how we fear, all this stuff. And I always go to this part about Psalm 139 because it's not that he doesn't know each one of us. Just like he empowered in Luke 9 for them to have that power and authority. And he tells them to go preach the word and heal the sick. It's not changed. The Great Commission isn't changed because we're in 2021. It's changed because the people that he's told us to go, we don't want to hear and we don't want to do. But we want to let that word of God, either some of us in the church, is falling by the wayside. It's falling on rocky ground. It's falling on thorny ground. And we don't want to admit it. We just say, oh, I'm just doing what I got to do. Ain't nobody going to say nothing. You're right. Most people are not going to say nothing. But God, but you're going to have to give an account to God. You won't have to give an account to me ever, ever. So let's go to Psalm 139 and end this for the night. Oh, Lord, you've searched me and you've known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. All that list of the six things that people be talking about, I be talking about too. Y'all know the truth. God knows the truth. Verse four says, for there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high and I can't attain it. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. Now, I can't read all of Psalm 139. And for those who listen to Milkshake Monday regularly, I love going to the scripture. But jump over to verse 16. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written. Saints of God, I don't use that expression very often, but saints of God, of the living God. The people are talking about nonsense. You're listening to nonsense. And no, I'm not telling you to be a pushy or be, you know, fully yourself and jumping in people's conversations, but you're there at these conversations. There are some times that you got to listen to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, what you want me to say? That's part of the preach word of the kingdom. What do you want me to do? Don't always think that it's going to be something profound. It could be something that's just a touching word about who Christ is to you. I saw something on Facebook from a family member talking about forgiveness. This forgiveness is forgiveness that Christ forgives and forgets. It hurts me and pains me to see that loved ones who say they love Christ aren't willing to forgive one another and can be estranged for year after year. That's not Christ-like. You can keep making it seem like it is, but it's not Christ-like. It's not showing love. The people have to start speaking up and telling people what thus saith the Lord. 
because the time is winding down. The people are dying. And where we, when we saw that thing about the condo thing, all those people went to bed, went into their house, and they were comfortable, not knowing that moments, hours, minutes later, that the place was going to collapse. And now these people possibly are going to have to give an account, because I don't know who's dead or alive, but I'm saying potentially there's a lot of people who have died in that collapse, and they were not expecting that their life would end. And some of them in their 40s and 20s and teenagers and all those age groups, and God is it's done. And they're going to have to give an account for their lives. So as you and I are here safe, thank you, Lord, for that. Every moment that he gives the breath of life, we're supposed to be praising him. We're supposed to be testifying of who he is. If the crowd doesn't know who he is and they're confused, which the Facebook, Instagram, and all the conversations you hear, they are very confused. But we have to get that question that Christ asked his disciples. But who do you say I am? And when more of us start to read the word of God and have an understanding through the Holy Spirit, who's going to be pointing to Jesus Christ for who Jesus Christ is, we will start making changes in lives and neighborhoods and counties and states and jurisdictions and worlds all around the whole globe. If we start to share who Christ is through the word of God, through the Holy Spirit working in you. I pray that something tonight has been said to touch you, to shake you up, to get you more serious about what we have to do to share the message of Jesus Christ to all that the Holy Spirit puts in our path. All of those people, they're there. The true scripture is true. The harvest is ripe, but the labors are few. It's because of a love problem, a self problem, a problem where we're thinking about ourself and our conveniences instead of saying, what can I do for the Lord? How can I share his truth to more and more people and bear good fruit, bear fruit? That's what Christ wants us to do. He's pruning us so we can bear more fruit. I love you and Lord willing, I'll see you next week.